Jesus said in Matthew 28 verse 19, Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Welcome to Go Teach All Nations, bringing you Christ's teachings through Australian and international speakers. And here is today's presenter, Sharissa Fong. Before we go any further, I invite you to bow your heads with me as we open with a word of prayer. Loving Father in heaven, thank you for a new day and, and life and for the opportunity to come here and to begin the year together uh, studying your word. And we ask, Lord, that your spirit would speak to our hearts very clearly today, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever found yourself in a strange place? Yeah, I think all of us have found ourselves in strange places at some time. But friends, if there is one place all of us ought to be found, it's to be found abiding in Christ. Can you say amen? I invite you to take your Bibles and just turn with me to the book of John. John chapter 15 and verse 4. John chapter 15. And notice verse 4 with me. John 15 verse 4. They're the words of Jesus. And you may already know the text that says, Jesus says, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Now friends, if you've ever read the Gospel of John right the way through, and if you've read 1st, 2nd and 3rd John, then you will know that the word abide is one of John's favorite words. He uses it all the time, and it comes from a Greek verb that means to stay. That is, to stay in a connected relationship with Jesus. That's what John is talking about. And I'd like you to notice this quote from Acts of the Apostles. It says, If we abide in Christ, if the love of God dwells in the heart, our feelings, our thoughts, our actions will be in harmony with the will of God. Do you want that for your life? Your thoughts, your feelings, your actions to be in harmony with the will of God? Well, friends, if that's what we want, then it is not enough for us to just casually abide with Jesus. It's not enough for us just to come to GYC and stay with him here and then go home and then forget about him. We must stay with Jesus 24-7. Because he says, without me, you can do nothing. And friends, if there was ever a man who knew the truth of this, Elijah did. And I invite you to join us in our theme story this morning in the book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 19. We'll just park ourselves there when we get there. 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19 and we'll begin in verse 1. 1 Kings chapter 19. Verse 1. Okay, here we go. Verse 1 and 2. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Friends, when Ahab's chariot pulled into his palace driveway there in Jezreel that night, he jumped out of it and he ran for the front door, almost drowning in the process. And the moment he reached the front door, he was met by a very excited Jezebel. Oh, what took you so long? Where have you been, Ahab? Where's that crazy Tishbite now? All day long, she'd been home waiting for him, whether or not she had seen the fire fall from heaven, the Bible doesn't say. But she knew that something had happened that day. After all, it was raining again. And so Ahab, still dripping wet from his chariot ride home and vowing to buy a convertible chariot for all future wet weather engagements, he began to tell her the amazing story. He told her of Elijah's compelling invitation before all the people. How long will you limp between two opinions? If the Lord is God, then follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. He told her of the contest. Oh, sweetheart, believe me. 
We waited all day for the prophets of Baal to be able to get Baal's attention and for Baal to answer, but he did nothing. The prophets chanted every prayer in the book, but nothing worked. And yet the moment the last prayerful word left Elijah's lips, fire fell from heaven with a clap of terrific thunder. I wish you could have seen it. I mean, one moment there was a sacrifice on an altar drenched in water, and the next there was just this burnt black spot on the ground with a wisp of smoke curling up from it. We all gasped, and then the people started shouting, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. I have never seen anything like it in my life. It was amazing. And Jezebel was stunned speechless. It was an impressive story that her husband had to share with her that evening. But as Ahab continued, and Jezebel learnt that as part of Elijah's little revival, he had also had all of her favorite prophets slaughtered, her eyes flashed fire and she was livid, beside herself with rage, without even waiting to hear the end of Ahab's account. She was on her computer writing an email to Elijah telling him what she thought about him. But the internet was down because of all the rain. And so she screamed for a messenger who came running at top speed and she sent via that messenger express post a death threat to the prophet clad in camel hair who had had the nerve to defy her faith and her father so shamelessly and so publicly. You see, her dad was the high priest of Baalism and king of the Sidonians. And we're just going to pause right here. Because let's think about this. If Jezebel truly wanted to terminate Elijah's life, then don't you think that the messenger which she sent should have been a hitman? Hmm? That would make sense to me. I mean, if you want to kill him, well then go ahead and do it, but don't give him warning. What, what good does that do? So why the hesitation? Well, friends, Satan knew, along with everyone else in the universe, that Elijah belonged to God. Elijah was God's man. And he knew that he couldn't touch him. He couldn't take his life, which is why he uses Jezebel to do the only thing he could do to him. And that was threaten his life. And Satan's good at doing that. Do you remember what he said to God of Job? He said, yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. He knows the human psyche. And friends, meanwhile, the spirit of prophecy tells us that a weary Elijah, emotionally spent and physically beat from his 24-kilometer marathon, I looked that up last night, 14 miles, from the mountaintop down to the palace at chariot speed, no less, he was sound asleep just outside Jezreel that night. When Elijah put his head down, Oh, his heart was full of joy, and whose heart wouldn't be? What had happened that day was amazing. It was a great revival. And he was convinced that as Ahab, the now converted king, went in to tell Jezebel the way things would be from now on, well, he was convinced that she would just fall into line along with everything else, and it would be the greatest revival and reformation that the church had ever seen. But here is where he made his first mistake. One should never, ever, ever assume that they know what a woman is thinking. <laughs> and I'm glad no one said amen to that. So we continue reading. Ah, who said that? <laughs> verse, verse 3. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life, and he went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. Friends, had Elijah continued to remain in, a, in an abiding relationship with God, at this point in time he should have turned his eyes to the one who had preserved his life until now and cried out, Oh God, help me! Save me! And I believe that God would have come through for Elijah. Do you believe that? Remember what God said to Asa? He says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, searching for hearts who are loyal to him so that he can be strong for them. I believe God would have come through for him. But instead of turning to the Lord, he set his sights on a getaway and far away. 
And uh, I remember when I was in high school, obviously it's not that long ago, but when I was in high school, I remember one of the boys who took me to one of my high school formals. I actually didn't go to a Seventh-day Adventist high school. So all those stories I told you yesterday happened in a Christian high school, not a Seventh-day Adventist one. And uh, he was a very nice boy that took me to the formal, but he was also a very shy boy. And uh, we went to the formal, we had a nice time there, and on the way home, he didn't have his license, much to his embarrassment, so his dad had to pick us up, drive us home. Anyway, so we were on the way home, and when we pulled into our driveway, my driveway, when we pulled into my driveway and uh, his dad turned the car off, I don't know, I just sort of got a little bit excited and I thought something special might happen here. You know, maybe I've read too many books where people, or or seen movies where people might have been in situations like this and special things happened. You know, I thought maybe he might have had a a flower under the seat, a rose, you know, just one, not many, just one, and he'd give it to me and thank me for my time. Or, Or maybe he had a box of chocolates, not that that's good for you, but he had a box of chocolates and he wanted to thank me with a box of chocolate. So maybe a box was too much. Just one chocolate, a little card, something. And so I was there sitting in the car with great anticipation. And sure enough, something special happened. His dad turns the car off and the boy looks at me and he says, Well, have a good life. <laughs> that was it. Have a good life. At which point his dad practically exploded in the front seat. Is that all you can say to her? <laughs> but friends, I've tried to remain true to those words. Have a good life. And friends, when I read the story right here, I'm reminded of that because the Bible tells us that Elijah, he comes with his servant and they get to Beersheba Station and the moment they get to Beersheba Station, the Bible says, well it doesn't say this but it implies this, that Elijah turns to his servant And the Hebrew word used here is a word that most definitely indicates this man was a young person. He turns to him, this person who had watched him on on the mountain and watched him do many wonderful things for God and probably wanted to grow up and be just like him. And he basically says to him, well, have a good life. He was leaving the servant behind because Elijah wasn't planning on coming back. This was it. He was out. And friends, it would be good for us to remember at this point in time the words of a wise Scottish minister. He said, let us be as watchful after the victory as before the battle. Amen. It's kind of pathetic when you and I stop to think about it, that he who had stood alone and fearless before the king of Israel and all those false prophets, that he who was one of the mightiest of the prophets should crumble and run at the word of one angry woman. It's pathetic, isn't it? As someone once said, um, when I, if, if I go to heaven, I want to see what Moses and Elijah look like. But if I don't make it, I want to see what that woman looked like because she must have been scary. Perhaps it was this story that inspired King Solomon to write in Proverbs 21 and verse 19, better to dwell in the wilderness than with an with a angry, with a contentious and angry woman. And again, thank you for not saying amen. Friends, we can smile at the cowardice of God's prophet, but the sad reality is that many of us are caught reacting to life situations in exactly the same way. I'm embarrassed to admit this to you, but I share it with you so you know I'm just as human as everybody else. But when I was writing this particular presentation, I got an email from somebody, and it was a Jezebel kind of email. And when I got this email, I let this email eat me up for a whole week. Everything it accused me of was wrong and I knew it, but still I let it do it to me. I couldn't sleep. I'd, you know, I'd say my prayer at night and then I'd lie down and then I'd dream about the email in my sleep. Or I'd wake up in the morning and I'd pray, but it was there. It was right there in my face all the time. And like Elijah, I wanted to run. I felt like getting out. Has it ever happened to you? A friend criticizes your faith and so you run or you compromise. Somebody offends you, a church member offends you, so you run and want out. Happens all the time in many different ways and when it happens, we stop abiding with Jesus. We stop abiding in his word. We stop praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit because we believe that such prayers are pointless. And as I read this story, I wonder how many of God's people are sitting on the sidelines of this life and of God's work 
because a Jezebel has scared them. We read verse 4. But he himself, that is Elijah, went a day's journey into the wilderness and he came and sat down under a broom tree and he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Have you ever felt so invincible, running towards your dreams, only to trip over reality and hit your head on the truth? Sometimes as Christians, and this is a Morris Fenden quote, sometimes as Christians we think we can brave the storms on a thousand seas and then we go ahead and drown in the bathtub. Poor Elijah. Ironically here he is begging God to take his life while running from the one person who would have gladly taken it for him. His song had changed. It was now no longer take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. It was take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to me. He saw his ministry as futile and pointless. Poor Elijah. But friends, I'm glad this story is included in the Bible because it reminds us that Elijah wasn't all hero. He was human too. And as in the book of James, chapter 5 and verse 17, it says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And right here, he was caught in the backwash of his own victory and guilty now of believing his own press. And friends, we should pause here and just point out that fear is a tool of Satan. Fear has held many people back from ventures of success. Fear will send us running back in defeat when we ought to be running forward to victory. But friends, God has a solution for fear. He says, fear not. And then he gives us the greatest reason why. For I am with you. And friends, when the Christian is found safely abiding in Jesus, they can say, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Amen. That was an amen point. Kim Shearer, she's a Christian author, she writes how one night she put her son to sleep and a storm came over and there was this great big clap of thunder and she knew the moment she heard it that it would wake him up and he'd be scared. And so she went to his room and as soon as she got to the doorway, he said, Mommy, would you come and stay with me until I go to sleep? She said, Sure, honey. And so she went and she sat by his bed and watched him go to sleep, waited for him to drift off. And as he was falling asleep, she realized something. That he hadn't asked her to make the storm go away, but that he had simply asked her to stay with him until the storm passed by. And she thought, how many times when I pray, do I ask God, Lord, please take the storms away, when really my prayer should be, Lord, please stand by me, stay with me until this storm passes by. When the storms of life are raging, let our prayer be, Lord, stand by me. Amen? Verse 5 and 6. Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel of the Lord touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Verse 7. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. And I'd like to just read you a quote here. It's from the Review and Herald, October 16, 1913. Listen to this. Did God forsake Elijah? Oh, no. He loved him no less when he felt forsaken of God and man than when in answer to his prayer, fire flashed from heaven and illuminated the mountaintop. As Elijah slept, a soft touch and a pleasant voice awoke him. He started up in terror as if to flee, fearing that the enemy had discovered him. But the pitying face bending over him was not the face of an enemy, but of a friend. And I love that last part, because this is much better than any Facebook friend. Amen. This person was right there when you needed them. And friends, I think that the journeys that a lot of people have to take in this life are what you might call too great for them. Is the journey you're on too great for you? That health crisis, it's too great for you. That financial situation, that financial crisis that you face, it's too great for you. The crisis you face in your home, in your family, 
You're right, it's too great for you. And friends, if the, if the journey you're on is too great for you, know this, that you and I have a friend in Jesus. Amen? And he's right there and he invites every single one of us to begin each day as Elijah began this one. He says, arise and eat. God doesn't expect for you to find the strength to meet life's trials on your own. He has graciously provided the bread of life to feed us and strengthen us for the journey. Amen? And notice verse 8. So he arose and ate and drank and he went in the strength of that food for how long? 40 days and 40 nights. It's good to know that God can make a meal last us when he blesses it for 40 minutes or 40 days. Amen? And for 40 days and 40 nights, which is biblical lingo for a very long time, Elijah travels clear across the desert. And as he does, every step he took, he misconstrued to be a catastrophe. Every wind that blew, he said, was unfair. Every ray of scorching sun, he scorned. It was a long journey until finally he comes to the holiest place he can think of, Mount Horeb, also known in the Bible as the mountain of God or Mount Sinai. And you and I know what happened at Mount Sinai. God has been at this mountain many times before. Friends, what was Elijah doing here? I don't believe Elijah had come all of this way to hide from God. It was the mountain of God. So, not that you can hide from God, but it's not a good place to go if you were trying to hide. So Elijah hasn't come here to hide, but I believe Elijah has come here because, friends, he is totally exhausted of his spiritual fluids. His oil is gone, his tires are flat, his brake fluid is all used up. He is on the brink of a breakdown and he knew it. Elijah has come here because he needed to hear a word from God. Elijah has come here because he needs filling. Elijah has come here because he needs to understand what God is doing in his life. And friends, it's good news to know that every time we feel this way, we don't have to wait for the next GYC. We don't have to hop on a plane and fly all the way back to Houston to try and hear the voice of God again. No, you can meet God wherever you are. Turn to Him wherever you are in whatever country you may be around this world and the Bible tells me that He will meet us a great way off just like He met the prodigal son. Amen? Amen. Verse 9. And there he went into a cave and he spent the night in that place and behold, the word of the Lord came to him and he said to him, What are you doing here? Elijah, while, while, while cowering in his cave on holy ground, having his own little pity party, God confronts Elijah with a question that is pregnant with meaning. What are you, my chosen servant for these times, whom I have honored and blessed? What are you doing here? in this desolate wasteland away from your duty when I am prepared and preparing to complete a great revival among my people. What are you doing here, Elijah? Your very name rebukes you. Elijah means the Lord is my God. What have you done with the Lord who is your God? What are you doing here, Elijah? And how much more God could have said. Up until this moment, Everywhere Elijah had gone and everything he had done, the word of the Lord had given him his mandate. At the word of the Lord, he had gone to the brook Cherith. At the word of the Lord, he had called Ahab to come to him. At the word of the Lord, he had sought out the widow of Zarephath. But friends, God never brought him here, which is why God had every reason to ask, what are you doing here? Verse 10. So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword and I alone am left and they seek to take my life. Wouldn't it be good if we could forget all of our problems as quickly as we forget our blessings sometimes? Elijah's response is very, very interesting. This is the response that he has been rehearsing for 40 days. And as fishermen's stories sometimes get a little bit bigger and bigger with each fresh retelling, so too Elijah has magnified his problems and minimized his God. Have you ever been where Elijah feels he is right now and felt that you're all alone, that you're the only one in your family, that you're the only one in your church 
the only one in your conference, the only one in your class at school, the only one in your office at work, you're the only one. Friends, sometimes when we stand for God and stand for truth, we can feel like we're standing alone. It was once a Christian farmer who had a negative neighbor. When the sun was shining, the Christian farmer would say, praise the Lord, he sent us the sun so the crops will grow. And the negative neighbor would say, oh, if it keeps shining, it's going to scorch the crops. Then the rain would come and the Christian farmer would say, praise the Lord, he sent us the rain to water the crops. And the negative neighbor who wasn't a Christian would say, oh, if it keeps raining, it's going to drown the crops. It was always negative. So the Christian farmer thought one day, what can I do to help win my neighbor? And he came up with an idea. This is not a true story. He came up with an idea. He decided that he would teach his dog to walk on water. So he did. And one day they were out on the lake duck hunting. Two ducks flew over. Christian farmer raised his rifle and he shot the two ducks. And then he said to his dog, go get him. And so the dog went out and he went over on the lake and he picked the two ducks up. And he came back to the boat, jumped back in, nothing wet, only his paws. And with that, the Christian neighbor turned to his negative neighbor and he said, so, what did you think about that? And the negative neighbor said, he can't swim, can he? <laughs> Whenever we find ourselves or hear ourselves talking like Elijah, always being negative and seeing no way out, we need to take a little bit of a reality check, don't we? Because it's not true. Listen to this quote, Prophets and Kings. Page 174 and 175, obviously it crosses over, it says, Nothing is apparently more helpless, yet really more invincible, than the soul that feels its nothingness and relies wholly on God. Amen. There should have been more amens, but I'll read it one more, once more. Nothing is apparently more helpless, yet really more invincible, than the soul that feels its nothingness and relies wholly on God. So friends, whenever you feel like Elijah, admit your nothingness to him, to God, and trust him and he will lift you up. Amen? Verse 11 and 12, what's God's response? Then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. I don't think they teach theology like this at Andrews or Avondale. Friends, or oh, let me say this, Elijah, don't tell God how zealous you've been and how wicked everybody else is and how bad Jezebel is. Jezebel's threats to your life were as insignificant as a mosquito is to you and I at a picnic before the almighty God. You, they, she are as nothing. You are a vapor which today is and tomorrow has vanished away. But he is the great I am. He has always been. He is king of kings and lord of lords. God doesn't need a sermon from you, Elijah. Right now he needs worship. And God makes nature the preacher. And he asks Elijah to consider this question. Can I not be trusted to protect your life and bless your ministry? It was a parable that might be translated into these eternal words, that it is not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Now, I believe God could have delivered Elijah through miraculous means, but he wanted to teach him a lesson. And I'd like to read the quote again. Prophets and Kings, page 169. It is not always the most learned presentation of God's truth that convicts and converts the soul. Not by eloquence or logic are men's hearts reached, but by the sweet influences of the Holy Spirit, which operate quietly yet surely in transforming and developing character. It is the still small voice of the Spirit of God that has power to change the heart. I don't know about you, but this is good news. Because sometimes we think we can only find God in crowds like this, in crowds like GYC. We look for the biggest churches and many people look for churches with the loudest music or the most uh, prominent preachers, whatever. They think that that's the only place you can find God. And I don't say you can't find God in these places. But I would like to submit to you this morning 
that God is more often found, he is always found, in the quietness of a trusting heart that chooses to simply abide in him. And you and I, we get to experience what Elijah was called to experience right here. We get to hear God's voice every day when we wake up. We can fall on our knees and spend time with him and his word. Amen? That still, small voice. And this reminds us here right too, that when we go back home, we're all excited to share what we have experienced and to share the gospel, that it is not our work to convert anybody. Don't go and that's not your job. Your job is just to shine and let Jesus shine through and be the witness. But it's the Holy Spirit that converts and changes hearts. Amen? And I've seen it happen in our church. We had a, a 90... A 90-year-old man, I think he was, who finally gave his heart to the Lord and was baptized at 90. And his wife had been praying for him for 70 years. 70 years. God answers prayer. And you know what? When they got married, he said, don't you try and convert me. And so she didn't. She just prayed because it's the Holy Spirit's job. And God did the rest. Amen? Verse 13. So it was when Elijah heard it, that's the still small voice, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? God says the same thing. In the early years of the Advent movement, there was a pioneer by the name of J.N. Loughborough. And Loughborough was a young minister at the time, but he became discouraged with the ministry because, well, the church was in its infancy and always struggling. It was hard to keep food on the table because the wage of a minister was not fixed at that time. And every time he came home, his wife was always complaining that he was always out too much. And all just got too much for him. And so he left the ministry and decided to just become a carpenter. And there's nothing wrong with carpentry. But friends, God had a call on his life. God had a different plan. And so he impressed Ellen White to go and call him to the ministry. So one day, he was in his carpenter's workshop and he heard a sleigh pull up outside. And he walks out and there was Ellen White sitting in the sleigh. And he goes to walk towards her. And you know what she did? She looked at him and said in the good old King James, What doest thou here, Elijah? He was taken aback. But he kept moving towards her. And again, she looked at him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? Well, he was a little bit frustrated to think that she might equate his situation with God's runaway prophet. So he made it a greeting and a third time, a third time she said to him, what doest thou here, Elijah? And sometimes it takes three times for you to get something. And when she said it the third time, he suddenly realized God needed him someplace else. Friends, caves are popular places for Christians, even Adventist Christians. Everybody wants a cave. It's the cave of discouragement. There's the cave of prejudice. There's a dark cave of unconfessed sin. And I'm not even just talking about the sins of the flesh that you and I can see in other people's lives. I'm talking about the sin of our Laodicean condition as a people sometimes. And God says to all of us, what are you doing here? This is not the time for us to be running and hiding in caves. I have no cavemen. You have counted yourself out when I still count you in. And so, listen to this quote. If dissension, envy, jealousy and strife are the fruit that we bear, it is not possible that we are abiding in Christ. So pray to the Lord Jesus. And this is the Review and Herald, September 1, 1891. Pray to the Lord Jesus that a holy influence may be brought into your life, an influence which shall subdue every passion, Hush every murmuring thought. Exalt your affections and purify your heart. Look up, look up. Come out of the cave of unbelief and stand with God. And friends, when Elijah hears the voice of God a second time, he gives God exactly the same answer. You can read it in verse 14. But notice God's response in verse 15. Then God, the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Hazael as king over Syria. Verse 18. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. 
Isn't it good to know that God has always had a remnant, no matter how small, in every generation? Amen? Elijah had traveled for 40 days and 40 nights all this way to tell God that he was the last soldier left in uniform and that if Jezebel got him, well, God would be a commander-in-chief without an army, only to be told that there were 7,000 others out there still marching to the drumbeat of eternity. And so God sends him back because there was a ministry back there for him. And friends, we are not all that God has got going for himself in this planet. Amen? God has his people, and we met some of them when we went out door knocking and on the streets. God has his people all over the place. They may not speak your language or know our jargon, but you know what? They know Jesus, and he knows them. Which is why Jesus says, Are the sheep I have which are not of this fault? Them also I must bring. And there will be one fold and one shepherd. Sir Isaac Newton, the brilliant mathematician and physicist that he was, he taught us a lot about gravitation and lots of other things. But at the end of his life, he was asked, what was the greatest discovery that you ever made? And he said, I have made two very great discoveries in my life. The one that I know I am a very great sinner and the other that I serve an even greater saviour. And centuries later, on a different mountain, Elijah got to meet that saviour, the Mount of Transfiguration. There, Moses and Elijah mingled their counsel and encouragement to encourage the Son of God as he faced the greatest mountain of this universe, a hill called Mount Calvary. They came there to encourage him, don't give up, don't give up, you mustn't fail. And you know what? I know that though you and I may fail, God will never let us down. Because on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. Prophets and kings again. He who was Elijah's strength is strong to uphold every struggling child of his. No matter how weak, fellow Christian, Satan knows your weakness. Therefore cling to Jesus. Abiding in in God's love, you may stand every test. Trials will come. But go forward. In no less marked manner will the Lord work now wherever there are hearts of faith to be channels of his power. Friends, what are we doing here? That's not a question I can answer for you. You have to answer it personally and we have to answer it corporately as a church because we are God's modern day Elijahs with an Elijah message to preach to the world. We are the people who find our prophetic roots in Revelation chapter 10. We are the people who find our prophetic identity in Revelation chapter 12. We are the people who find our prophetic mission and message in Revelation chapter 14. Amen? And Jesus looks at us and he says, You are the light of the world. If God has shone the light of the three angels' message into your life, don't hide it under your bed or in a bookshelf. Come out and let it shine. Let it shine wherever you are. Because one day soon, Jesus is going to come back and the three angels' message will triumph. And those who have been faithful to it will triumph with it as well. If God had answered Elijah's prayer there in the desert, he would have gone out in defeat and nobody would have noticed. But God had a better plan. God took care of Jezebel. Remember what happened to her? She became dog's food. And friends, he came and he took Elijah to heaven without ever seeing death. He prayed, Lord, take my life. And God said, no, I've got something much better for you. And I believe that one day soon, the exit that was Elijah's will be ours as well. And it's going to look a lot better than the fireworks on New Year's Eve. It's going to make the fireworks look primitive when Jesus comes back. Friends, are you enjoying the joy of an abiding relationship with Jesus? If you are, praise God. And when you leave this place, stay with him. Keep abiding. Are you running into the wilderness or cowering in a cave? Friends, now is the time to come to Jesus. Let him lift you up and when you feel you can't carry on because God has a call on your life. Every single person here today, God has a call on your life because he's got 7,000 out there still waiting to hear. And so friends, they live in your street. They may work in your workplace. They may live across the road, catch your bus. God's called you because he has 7,000 others out there. So what are we doing
here. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word this morning. We pray, Lord, that as you speak to our hearts as Sarah sings, I pray, Lord, that you will make your calling clear to us, that you will send us to places wherever you need us, and that you will help us, Lord, to stay with Jesus as we leave this place today. We praise you for the blessing of of GYC, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This message was made available by GYC. GYC, a supporting ministry of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, seeks to inspire and equip young people to be vibrant, Bible-based, and Christ-centered Christians. To download or purchase other resources, visit gycweb.org. Yeah.
That was Fountain View Academy singing Abide With Me. Up next, Sandra Entman will be singing My Quiet Time from the album A New Song Collective. Makes no sense to start my day without your leading. I need your help in every detail of my life. So I pause to spend some time with you. You who loves me, you who hears 
Hi, I'm the Two Tip Lady who loves to share tips to help make your life more simple and rewarding. Do you often feel that your life is dry and drab and boring? Then I've got two tips for you today, so listen up. You may not live in our blisteringly parched and dry Aussie countryside, so I'm just going to share a picture with you. I'm going to paint it in words. It's so easy to think that this drought-stricken, dry Aussie countryside is brittle, barren and boring. Aha, uh-huh, but it's not. Even though as far as the eye can see there's crunchy brown dead grass and our eyes are often blinded by dust whipped into whirly-whirlies by hot, skittish breezes, at ground level there isn't even a hint of green anywhere and at first glance the baked landscape seems deserted and desolate. But we've discovered that there really is beauty all around, if we look for it. Every day, we try to hike our 10,000 steps with our eyes and ears open, and you know we're always rewarded. So I'll describe our rewards from just one evening. An inquisitive young alpaca nosed up to the rickety fence and daintily accepted our offering of a bit of green grass that we'd carried with us from a more cultured spot. A sweet luxury not to be found in its pen. Our footsteps disturbed birds who'd been peacefully roosting in the early evening in their favourite trees. They sped off to perch single file on the power line, staring crossly at us and voicing their disapproval while we slipped past. Danger over, the loud whirring of their wings again accompanied their retreat to their favourite spot. Ah, true, natural country music. Lots of hungry kangaroos stood to attention like statues as we passed by. I wonder what they were thinking as their eyes followed us, whiskers twitching, with muscles flexed, ready to bound off if we came too close. We hiked past farmsteads surrounded by dreary, dry dirt, yet you wouldn't believe it, they had unbelievably green trees highlighting their driveways. Just how those trees are decorated with green leaves is a complete mystery to us when all the surroundings are a dark baked brown. They must have roots that extend deep into the dusty earth and tap into water down there somewhere. I photographed an old gnarled tree looking as if at some point it simply didn't have the energy to stand tall anymore, with its main trunk lying prostrate on the ground. But eventually it had risen above its circumstances and now beautifies the landscape with its swaying and lightly rustling pale green leaves. Perhaps it grew again after living well and falling after a massive drought. Just thoughts to ponder. Perhaps our lives seem drought-stricken and dreary. But let's keep our eyes open because all around us nature is an open lesson book, beckoning us to think, look and be rewarded with unexpected surprises that refresh and renew our hope. Is it ever easy to take that first of our daily 10,000 steps? Oh no, I know that, but we are always rewarded. We were rewarded again, every single time. We get going and do it. So here are my simple two tips for us all today. Do you want to stay green like the farmstead trees when you're surrounded with the barren and the dry? Tip number one, here it is. Take those first steps. Open God's Word and Guess what you do next? You read it. You may not feel like it, but do it anyway. You'll be rewarded, just like we are when we step out on our walk. You'll grow a deep root structure that will feed you and bring delight that you can share. Psalms chapter 1 verse 1 and 2 promises this. This is what it says. Delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Wow! So what was tip number one? Take those first steps and read God's word. Tip number two, you ready for it? Train your mind to look for the beautiful and share what you find. If your life seems to be dry and drab and boring, turn your eyes outward. Notice the good around you and in others. Notice the unexpected little surprises that God brings your way. Share them with others and your own life will flourish too. Just reminding you, tip number one, take those first steps and read God's word. 
Tip number two, train your mind to look for the beautiful and share what you find. That's it from the Two Tip Lady today, who loves to help make your life more simple. Just about every natural history museum has a set of skulls, including some like these. If you're a biology student like me, you may have had to memorize the names of the various species each skull represents. Homo neanderthalensis, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, and so on. Each one a clue to the evolutionary origins of human beings from an ape ancestor. Or maybe not. Ancient skulls like this were possibly the most important scientific discovery relating to origins of 2013. These skulls, or rather those skulls, came from Dimenisi in the country of Georgia and were found in such close proximity that they seem to have been part of the same group, yet they show significant variation in shape. Skulls with similar variations, when found individually, have been classified as different species. But the evidence from Dimenisi seems to indicate they're all one species. What are the take-home lessons from evidence like the Dimenisi skulls? One is that the science of anthropology can be volatile, with single discoveries profoundly changing the way evidence is viewed. Another is that the fossil record of humans, and yes, these skulls are probably from humans, exhibit a pattern similar to the fossil records of other organisms with greater variability evident in the past than we see today. At least on the surface, this is the opposite of what Darwinism predicts. Finding fossils grouped together and exhibiting so much variation calls into question the practice of arranging fossils, human or otherwise, into assumed evolutionary sequences over time. Finally, it's interesting to note that while evidence like the Dimenisi skulls may upset some ideas about human evolution, they're not inconsistent with the biblical record of history. It's been a pleasure bringing you this program here on 3ABN Australia Radio.